Thank you for coming to uh, watch and listen to this talk in this beautiful flower meadow. Um, this is the, uh, another series of our talks are planted on earth in partnership with the National Trust at our beautiful venue of Stourhead House. Um, in our latest series of talks titled Good Design, Sustainable Futures, Cool Design, Sustainable Futures, we'll be exploring how design, the design of places, spaces and systems can mitigate against the twin threats of climate crisis and biodiversity loss. For last summer, for the first time on record, the UK experienced temperatures of in excess of 40 degrees centigrade. And according to the United Nations report published last month, the world is almost certain to experience new record temperatures over the next five years, with temperatures likely to rise above 1.5 degrees uh, above pre-industrial levels. So as we enter uncharted territory, the threats posed to human civilization, ecosystems, economies and global infrastructure are just beginning to be understood. So in a world which is hotting up, what role does design play in keeping us cool and creating a world where humans can live in harmony and nature and natural systems? So I'm delighted for this fifth talk uh, entitled Taking the Heat Out of Farming, we're going to be exploring what innovations are available to farmers to improve yields without damaging the environment and exacerbating climate change. And what role does carbon sequestration have for landowners looking to play their part in achieving net zero? So to join me in this talk, we've got a fantastic, experienced, diverse uh, panel of speakers. We have Helen Browning from the Soil Association, Tom Metier from Angel Org Cottage Organics, and Jess Abyss from Farmers Footprint. So what I'm going to do, uh, first of all, is ask each of our speakers to introduce themselves for a few minutes so that you know a little bit more about their background and their experience. We've then got about half an hour of questions and conversation, and I'm then going to open the questions up to the floor. So if you've got any questions, write them down, and we'll have at least 15 minutes at the end to try and get through as many as possible. So firstly, can we have a little bit of a round of applause for our speakers, just to break the ice and to make them feel welcome. Thank you. And I'd like to ask Helen to start off and to tell us a little bit more about her background and experience. Helen. Hi, you. thanks. Um, I'm Helen Browning. I'm Chief Executive of the Soil Association, and uh, you probably know the Soil Association uh, founded in 1946 and very much pioneered organic food and farming in the UK and actually helped with standard setting globally. Um, and today uh, is also very involved in sustainable forestry, uh, in helping people eat better in schools and hospitals and other public settings and in the whole innovation agenda. How do we help farmers uh, shift rapidly in the right direction, not just organic farmers, but all farmers. Um, and um, my background, um, I've been with the Soil Association on and off all through, my all through my working life. I was a trustee there in the 1990s and been chief exec for the last 12 years. But I'm also a farmer myself. So I farm uh, in North Wiltshire, uh, mostly as a tenant of the church. I farm about 1,600 acres there. Um, uh, but of the, and I've been organic since, well, the first field went organic in 1984. Um, so a lifetime of farming, a mixture of livestock and crops, and trying to do more with that food, feed people locally through our uh, village pub and hotel and through our own brand in the supermarkets and other places. Um, so a lifetime of trying to make organic food work. And, um, uh, and in the last few years, I've become had a little bit of land that I actually own. And that's allowed me to experiment with agroforestry. So bringing trees into the farmed environment, farming with trees rather than thinking that trees are things that live over there in woods and forests. And we have these broad acre fields with no trees in sight, not like in here. This is amazing to be in this uh, lovely wooded and meadowed environment. So that's been the something I've been working on very hard over the last eight or 10 years in my non-soil association life and actually in my soil association life as well. And it's lovely to be working both practically and uh, trying to influence governments and policymakers as to how to do things better. That's me. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm Tom Metier, and um, I farm with my partner a small soil association organic farm in North Dorset, about 40 minutes away. Um, it's really small. It's about 42 acres in, in total. Um, and we farm uh, beef. Uh, we have a small flock of sheep. We have uh, some breeding sows and, and raise uh, pork. 
Um, we do geese and turkeys at Christmas. Um, we have planted, um, not on the scale of Helen, but we've planted um, a lot of trees and hedgerows um, and, our, and, and two acres of orchard. And our main business is uh, what people would call broiler birds or meat chickens, um, uh, which uh, work symbiotically really with the orchards that we've planted. So we have all those uh, under our trees. So um, we have tried to integrate as much as possible uh, our livestock with the environment. Um, we also run some courses and workshops and stuff on the farm as well to make our ends meet. Um, and I would, I suppose we would call ourselves regenerative farmers. Um, and we are both, and particularly me, passionate about wildlife, passionate about the environment and that symbiotic relationship between um, growing food, the health of the food and the health of the animal and, and the environment in which we live. Thank you. Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm Jess Abbas, and I'm head of a nonprofit called Farmers Footprint. And we're here to uh, accelerate and support a transition to a regenerative food and farming system. Uh, my, I'm not a farmer, unfortunately. I would love to be a farmer. Uh, but I've worked with farmers for the last 10 years. And that start, my journey started with a uh, brownie, actually. My mum and I had a brownie business, which we started um, at home in our home kitchen. And over a period of 10 years, I um, worked to develop a direct supply chain with a group of farmers across lots of different countries from Spain to Sri Lanka and Latin America. And it just gave me an insight into our global food system and got me into a bit of a wormhole into looking at the complexities of the issues which span across farming practices to how much farmers or how little farmers are being paid. And yeah, it's it's got me into this trajectory of just being wanting to see a regenerative transition across uh, our food and fibre and farming system. So, yeah, that's me. Thank you. So I'd like to just set the scene. Um, from what I understand, the current agricultural system is broken. And I don't want to say the traditional farming system because it seems that it's quite, a, a, I mean, a relatively recent thing that we've gone off on a particular tangent from a particular date. Can you just sort of paint a picture of, of how you feel the farming system uh, and agricultural and food production system is broken? Uh, Helen, maybe you'd like to start, but I think you're all going to have yeah. a different perspective on it. I mean, I think if you, uh, if you, I don't think there was ever any golden era in farming. I don't think, I think we should sort of not think that the once upon time, everything was rosy and everybody had a wonderful, healthy diets and farming was all done wonderfully well. But I think the, the turn we took after the Second World War, for all the understandable reasons uh, that we had this pressure to produce more and more food from our own resources. If you remember in the UK, we've been, you know, raping and pillaging the colonies for the previous couple of hundred years. And so we hadn't been producing actually that much of our own food. Um, we had this drive to produce food here. And uh, that coincided with the advent of the Harbour Bosch process and the ability to, 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 to derive synthetic fertilizers. People needed to think about what to do with all the things they'd learnt about and created during the war, the chemicals and the fertilizer, the nitrogen that they'd created for the war effort. So all of that was sort of diverted into agriculture. And uh, and it was all about that drive to produce more food, and uh, you know our wonderful downland pastures up on our uh, Marlborough Downs, you know they were all ploughed up on a compulsory basis after the war um, because we had to grow more cereals. So you know every every farmer was taught, and I think this still lingers in our cultural memory that our job is to feed the world and that we have to produce as much as we possibly can. You know two ears when where one grew before, and that was our job was to produce more food. But we did that in a way which threw out a lot of traditional wisdom and replaced that with, a, with the agrochemicals that have been a large part of the reason why we've lost virtually all of our biodiversity, uh, why we are causing such a challenge um, from a climate change po uh, point of view. And probably the one thing you didn't mention in your, in your intro, Oliver, was the way that this has impacted on human health. Um, how our whole food system has gone from being quite diverse um, and a shorter supply chains and more circular because we had to actually uh, maintain our waste within the system. Our manures were valuable rather than things that just get, got flushed down our rivers. 
Um, you know, but all of that led to us growing a few big commodity crops and then a food industry that converted those into what we now call ultra processed foods, junk food, um, which has made us sick. So the whole system is um, broken. It it's not because people were trying to break the system. I think the profit drivers have been, you know, a real challenge in there. But it was it came from that post-war. We've got to feed more people and we've got to feed them from our own resources and all that technology looking for a home. And that has driven farming in the direction that it's gone and driven our food system in a way that's made us really sick. Uh, Tom, you've adopted or bought farms that have been a, a product of this system. Can you just kind of paint a picture of what that looks like? Yes. Yeah, so when we um, we moved in 2012 to our present farm, and um, it had actually been it had actually been farmed organically, but it had also been a monoculture. So basically, it was used as a silage lay, which is um, a combination of rye, Italian rye grasses, and there was some red clover in there, which was kind of nice to see when we arrived, but. Um, it was just uh, ploughed up every few years and 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 reseeded with with one crop and one uh, a, a, a bit about growing wheat really or growing grass as 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 a as a commodity um, to feed um, cattle and and it's it's quite a depressing thing to see actually all the hedgerows have been grubbed up over the years uh, there was no trees the hedgerows had been flailed to an inch of their lives. Um, and so there was no bird life, there was no butterfly life. There was, and, and, and of course, if you have um, hedgerows which have been flailed to the inch of their life, there's going to be no insects. So of course the birds are not interested in being there. And so the process for us was about looking at a piece of land and saying, okay, what's our responsibility here? Where, where do we want to leave this at the end? And I think I absolutely um, uh, agree with what Helen's saying, but I think there has been in that industrialization, if you like, post-war of um, uh, British farming, for all the understandable reasons that Helen has outlined about, you know, our food security and what to do with the nitrogen from the armaments. And what has happened, in my opinion, is that, that the farmer, the, the actual person who is, is responsibility is to, to, yes, to grow food, but also to take care of the environment, um, and, and the land on which we, we, we grow that food as a custodian has that relationship has somehow been lost. Um, you only have to look at vast tra tractors and, and, and know that, you know, um, very often the people who are sitting in them don't actually get out of the tractor. Um, and so the, the, the more we um, mechanize and industrialize our farming, although that's very efficient in terms of income, it does stop the farmer having a relationship with the land and 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 smelling and touching and feeling and and having a sort of visceral reaction to, to to land and i think that for me as a farmer an organic farmer who who cares passionately about nature and about my environment is if we could uh, yeah it, it is the main problem is that we've the farmer has lost that relationship Seems sort of impossible to think that a farmer might sort of lose that responsibility or, or passion for. Uh, I think the resources if you, that... if you a, a, far, a lot of, I'm not saying all farmers by any means, and there's a lot that are not like that, but a great number of farmers see their bit, it's a business. And how do I make money out of this business? I may have been inherited into that business. I may have inherited the farm. I've gone to an agriculture college that doesn't teach any regenerative. Uh, you know, it's very, very recent that even agricultural colleges were teaching about soil. I'm not <laughs> even sure they are now. Um, I, I, it seems impossible that that. You know, I, I, and, and is it seen as an, an, an annual business, or are they think it? You know, we lost that ability to go. What's this going to be like in ten years' time? You were I, telling I, me about your neighbours. Yeah, right? I mean, I have a neighbour who um, who's inherited uh, the farm from his father and his uncles, and he's grown the farm to over a thousand acres and. And he he was overheard in our local pub saying, why would I worry about the soil? I'll be dead in 15 years, 20 years. It's not of any interest to me as long as I can grow the commodity crop I want to grow. Um, you know, it's for somebody else to worry about soil. Why would I worry about that? So I think that that, that key relationship between I see myself as a farmer, as a custodian of that land, and that, that my responsibility is to pass that land onto whoever takes it on, in a better shape, in a in a in in a way that is supporting more, both both in terms of its productivity. I don't want to not be have a productive farm. That would be, but you can. There are, is a possibility of having a, a productive farm 
and looking after land and looking after the nature and looking after the soil, which is what we we all need to grow food. And Jess, how are you seeing the impacts of these the, these systems uh, on the supply chains and the systems by which people are surviving from the land? I mean, you got involved through your brownie business, you know, but literally, you know, you, you, you were talking to me about, you know, investigating the origin and the provenance of, of these actual ingredients and became quite impassioned about that. Yeah, I just want to go back a step because I think after World War II, there was like this perfect storm of chemicals being left over and being reconstituted into farming and mixed with the fear of hunger that was left from World, World War II. So we had this fixation and obsession that we had to grow more food. And in the five years after World War II, I think it was 80% um, of hedgerows across the UK were ripped up to make bigger fields so we could produce food on a bigger scale. And it's a huge misconception that there's not enough food. We're constantly told there's not enough food to feed a growing population. It's actually that, that it's not being distributed properly. Um, apparently, we've gone from 20% of food waste in the 1970s to 50% in the UK now. So it's not a problem. It's not an issue with there not being enough food. It's just how it's being distributed. And coupled with this perfect storm of chemicals being left over from World War II and uh, the fixation of needing to grow more food to, because we had that fear of hunger was also the emergence of supermarkets. So if you look back 50 years, uh, we even in cities, we would have been shopping in you know local butcher, greengrocer, I was about to say candlestick maker. <laughs> That's, uh, I think, a rhyme, and I don't think those would have been candlestick shops. But, you know, you would have been having a direct relationship every day when you went to go and buy your food. And someone had a bright idea to put all of these shops into one, uh, you know, more convenient place and uh, develop a supermarket, which at that stage, coupled with the rise of the commodities market, which is basically food being traded rather than food being a, a, a vital right. It's, it's something that's traded on the stock markets. At that stage, coupled with the rise of supermarkets, we just saw the curtain of transparency in our food system go down. And we no longer had that direct relationship. And behind that curtain over the last 40, 50 years, there's just been this mass growth of complexities in our food system because we no longer have that connection with our farmer, with the people who are selling our food and um, with the land itself. So farmers, like Tom was just mentioning, very often are not even spending time on their land. They have agronomists that come to the farm office and will say these are the chemicals that you need to put on your land so the farmers no longer actually very often in chemical industrial farming watching their land and watching what's going on it's the agronomist who's telling them and there's there's actually an amazing project that I came across recently uh, it's a woman called Caroline Grindrod who's a regenerative consultant and she's setting up a training program to train farmers in regenerative practices to try and get them back onto that onto their land to be looking at the land because Regenerative farming is all about watching. We were talking about this just before we actually started the official talk. We were talking about how regenerative farming is just all about watching. You watch something. Uh, Tom, maybe I'll pass over to you, actually, because I just would love you to relay the thistle story. Go ahead. Yeah, I was just talking about, um, just before we started, about, um, we, you know, creeping thistle is a, a massive problem, Um uh, for for an organic farmer because we can't spray them, we can't get rid of them. They spread under the ground. Um, yeah, they can be a real pain. And in the past, we've kind of panicked about it and got the topper out and you know the perfect time to top them. And when they're just about to flower, and um, you know that will weaken the roots and it kind of doesn't really make any difference. And we just found in the last two three years when we started. Um, just allowing, um, well, we, we started kind of mob grazing with our cattle. And so we were leaving the grass much longer and allowing it to regenerate much quicker that where we had had massive patches of um, creeping thistle were just starting to get less and less and less. And um, just being on the land, watching the biodiversity, I mean, this meadow is just dreamy for me I just would dream to have a meadow like this um, it's got sheep sorrel and all sorts of different flowers in it and the more biodiversity you have in your land 
the less likely you will have lots of docks and weeds because the roots of the grasses are longer. And just watching that process, watching um, nature almost kind of rebalancing itself. Um, another thing is, is that a few years ago, we had a massive patch of... Um, uh, of creeping thistle in an area which we don't actually farm. It's like a little bit of a sort of a nature bit. It's a sort of, sort of rough ground and stuff um, with lots of blackthorn growing and hedges and trees and a pond. And um, there was a massive influx of painted lady butterflies um, and their main feed source is the creeping thistle. So the, all the creeping thistle just disappeared overnight. And I think that relationship, if, if in the past... We didn't have those chemicals to keep to, to to get rid of creeping thistle, and this country is not covered in creeping thistle, and never has been, and it's not covered in docks, and so it's the modern um, practices of farming that has has uh, made bare soil, has created um, those invasive um, weeds to take to take to take root, if you like, and if you if you farm with care and you allow the grasses to recover you get not only better biodiversity, which is incredibly important and exciting, um, but also you tend to get less of those things that will cause you problems. Does that? Have I said the same thing? <laughs> 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 Helen, it, it seems like, the, in a way, the farming system has become quite siloed in the way that each of these different aspects are approached. But it sort of covers over the inherent complexity of everything that's happening. What with you know economics, education, overcoming sort of traditional systems, soil health, subsidies. How do we uh, start to break this paradigm and move forward into a more regenerative approach? Uh, well, <laughs> where do you start? Um, I mean, I think I think one of the things we've always emphasised at the Soil Association is that you have to pull a lot of levers at once. You know, there's not a magic bullet or one. Thing that you can do or that you can get to happen that's going to solve what is this really complex matrix of um, of issues. And so, uh, you know, I think sometimes you need to look at what are the features of the systems that we're trying to develop? What, what do they look like and smell like? Um, and how do we know when we have choices to make as society which way to turn when you come to the crossroads? And uh, so I think that... Uh, in all that we do, um, we need to be embracing a lot more diversity. You know, whether you're talking about in farming, in people, in crops and livestock, in the foods that we eat, in education, wherever you go, um, that principle of diversity, there is not one solution. There's not one right approach, not what I'm doing, not what uh, Tom's doing, not what everybody's doing. It, we need to have a whole plethora of things going on around the place. So that, that diversity, I think, is a key thing. I think we need to be looking all the time at how do we close the loop? How do we recycle uh, everything that we do? How do we stop thinking in this linear fashion that our waste can just go out that door and away, uh, out of sight, out of mind? How do we actually, even when that's quite uncomfortable for us at times, uh, really concentrate on closing those loops and that sort of circular uh, design? I think we need to be thinking always about a fairer, food system or a fairer system overall the you know the the, the the gap the gaps we're seeing the disparities we're seeing in society are getting ever ever greater and that's going to lead to massive uh, uprisings and concerns and lost opportunities so how do we rebalance the system um, and that about that 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 balance word which you used just now Tom uh, for me is always uh, a crucial one to here too. You know, the, we, we tend as a society to be thinking about things in black and white. We want there to be, you know, the, the concrete, the, the, this, is the, this is the position. Actually, very often, um, the art of the job, and it is an art, is blending and finding that route through some of these quite polarised debates um, and finding ways where you can move, where you can take people with you. Uh, where you can do that from the ground up with with communities, with people, because we can expect a lot more than we're getting from our leaders, but we actually can expect a lot more uh, than we're getting from ourselves and our ability to come together as communities to affect change. So I think, uh, you know, that, that that's not a very, like, pull this lever and everything will be all right. Um, but I think it's some of the things we need to be watching out for and trying to uh, bring into whatever we're trying to achieve in the world. Those are the things I'd be looking out mm. for. And Jess, you, when we spoke before, you had a, a lovely tree analogy. 
for this circular system. Did you want to sort of tell us a little bit more about that? Because it just sort of reframes it. Yeah, so I like to think of regenerative systems because I, for me, regener regeneration goes beyond just in agriculture. We can have regenerative businesses, re regenerative communities. It's, it's a circular model, I believe, in how we can live on this planet. And I always like to look at how things operate in nature. And I was thinking about, uh, someone asked me the other day, what is regeneration? And I was thinking of a tree and how a tree absorbs nutrients. It takes what it needs from the soil. It produces leaves and then the leaves fall back to earth. They're composted and it's a circular system. So, yeah, I, th I think that's how we how we need to operate in farming. We need to watch and mimic nature, uh, but also we need to we, we've been in this stage of extraction for so long and we need to move into a phase of giving back um, beyond just how we're taking from the earth. How do we give back to farmers? Farmers aren't being paid enough at the moment. They're very often paid a uh, commodities price for their crops. And as part of a project I did in Mexico last year, we developed a living income price for farmers. So we were looking at what are their costs of labor? What are their costs of production? What are their yields? And how does that measure with the benchmark of a minimum income, which is really how we should be paying farmers. Farmers often aren't even making a profit. Um, they're under so much financial pressure from chemical companies and yeah we really need to think about I, th I think how we're giving back um, in in our food system. And, and what does that mean for you Tom and the sort of nuts and bolts of running a farm and running a business not just you know pulling all those different levers but also engaging with your customers and you know communicating those benefits and, and I guess importantly getting them to buy into the the wonderful uh organic products that you're producing? So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's, 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 not, it's not easy <laughs> uh, to do so, but I think the, that what struck me with what you're saying about the amount that a, a farmer is paid, it sort of goes back to our original point about that relationship between farmers and land and, 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 and how we value food as, as, as a, as a, as a, as a nation, as a, as a, as a, a well, as, as the world, really, um, you know, food used to be kind of an important part of our income. You know, we spend a, a, a great majority of our, our, our income or, or a, a much greater uh, majority of our income on food than we do now. So we don't, I think, I mean, some of us do, of course, but a lot of people don't value food in the same way. And I think that's, it's really interesting. It's to do with the relationship of people with land as well. It's, it's to do with the way in which farmers communicate what they do. I think a lot of people think that farmers are this sort of people who live out there in the countryside and don't kind of, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of separate from everybody else. But we're just, we're just, <laughs> we're the same as everyone else. We, we, we care, a lot of us do. Um, and when, I think we need, we as farmers need to be much more um, engaging with the public. And from my point of view, on a very, very small farm, the only way to make it work and be financially viable is to sell direct to the customer. So we don't sell anything through anybody apart from, you know, I, I stand on farmer's markets and, and people come to me and buy stuff. And, and um, we have a little couple of local shops that are really local to us, organic shops that sell our produce. But in that way, you, you do get a relationship between the customer and yourself and you're able to explain what you do and you explain why you do it in the way that you do it and you're also able to bring those people onto the farm which I think is really really important um, a lot of people see the product the food product at the end and that's all they see and I think it's a I think for us as farmers um, particularly regenerative farmers who are passionate about doing it in this way organic farmers it's really important to to, to, to bring people onto the farm and, and for them to see how we actually do things. And that, the, the, that food, whatever it is, be it, be it the wheat for the bread or the chickens that I produce or, uh, you know, the pigs for the pork, all, it, it, it's not just in a packet. I always say to people, you know, this is just, this is just a tiny bit of that process actually that chicken's been alive for a long time it was born it was raised it was fed with organic food there's a whole backstory going on as well and i think if people the public felt a relationship with food then i think it would be a really um much easier for our farmers to to, to earn better money because i think people would then value food and pay more for it
I think we pay, we don't pay enough for our food, in, in my opinion. No, no. I, I, and I think maybe farmers are partly responsible in a, in a way, you know, that, that whole idea of get off my land. Yes. You know, we're not <laughs> even going to allow you to walk across it. So how are they going to engage? But then equally... Including me sometimes. What you... <laughs> really? Okay. Be careful. Uh, but the, the way that you were talking about that relationship with the customer is yeah. so different to the way probably a majority of people are now shopping. I mean, not just going to the supermarket and wandering up and down a faceless aisle with people just packing shelves who have no responsibility or no connection, but then shopping online and, you know, not even reading the packets or yeah. holding it or looking at it, just going, well, that's the right size, the right price. It's in the shopping basket. So that disconnection is happening more and more. Uh, but so I just say, I think that Jess's point about the supermarket is just incredibly important. Mm. You know, I grew up in a small town where, as a child, I remember there being about six butchers and about five green grocers and three fishmongers. And, you know, I'm, I'm still teased by my family because I walk around the town going, oh, that used to be a butcher or that, you know. But, but they were and, and there were no supermarkets. And I think that, that daily shopping, that relationship had a massive impact on people. I just touch on Tom's point as well because um, about the value of food because, uh, well, there was a report done recently by the Sustainable Food Trust the hidden cost of food and it said that for every one pound we spend on food there's a hidden cost of the taxpayers money so we're not seeing the effects of this cheap food directly on and the impacts on our health but there's also been a huge correlation with the release of chemicals into our agricultural system and the decline of health and the increase of chronic disease so for example when the patent for glyphosate which is the key component in roundup was released in the in the early 90s we saw a huge increase in alzheimer's autism um parkinson's and cancer and we've been told for decades that these chemicals aren't affecting our health but there's now scientific research to show that they are, glyphosate is a water-soluble chemical. It penetrates our gut lining and it interrupts the ways that our cells communicate with each other. And when a cell thinks it's isolated, it starts multiplying and that's when we see cancer. So we really need to start questioning our food. We need to, under, I think, um, yeah, we need to remember that there's, a, you know, a value in in buying, it might be slightly more expensive. And I know that we're in a housing crisis, uh, not a housing crisis, that as well, but we're in an economic crisis. But just that we, yeah, really need to start seeing the value of, of food and placing that as important as all the other material things that we now spend our money on, going out to eat, nice cars, et cetera. Uh, yeah, we just need to start valuing farmers uh, so, and food. Sort of Sorry, huge, ran over. <laughs> huge pressures on, uh, on, on the general public, on the food system. Uh, and, and anxieties from farmers wanting to improve yields. Helen, could you tell us a little bit more about what the Soil Association are doing? You've got this innovative farmers program. Mm. How are you helping farmers to improve yields, but, uh, but also improve the system? Yeah, two things it might be worth talking about there. One is Innovative Farmers, which has been running for about the last 10 or 11 years. Um, and, you know, you have to recognise that actually a lot of the innovation that we're looking for is uh, not about more products that are going to be sold to us. That's where most of the money in research goes. It goes to companies that are creating wealth, creating products uh, to sell to us farmers. Um, so what we need in agriculture is is uh, a lot better and some more sophisticated knowledge as to how to manage those systems better without all those inputs. Um, Innovative Farmers gives farmers who want to come together to tackle a challenge or to try something new, small, really easy to access grants um, that allows them to test that out at no cost to themselves. And it's been incredibly successful. Uh, we've run over 125 now of these field labs over the last 10 years, and they've uh, really increased our body of knowledge as to how to you know, improve soils more rapidly, uh, move into bi-cropping systems, how to cure diseases like mastitis without using antibiotics, just loads and loads of really exciting work. And I think, you know, the, the, the bright spot, one of the many bright spots um, uh, when we're looking for hope in the future is that farmers are really shifting their attitudes quickly. They know, they finally recognise, an awful lot of them have now recognised that their soils have run out of steam, uh, that they want to do things more regeneratively, that they're really interested in some of the things that organic farmers have been doing for a long time, but taking on some of that knowledge, even if they're not going to go organic. And approaches like Innovative Farmers helps those farmers come together, learn really quickly uh, from a researcher, which will, will support them in trial design and that kind of thing, so you get good data out of it. But they'll learn really quickly about what's been done before, what, how they can test something now, 
and then we help communicate the results of those trials to every farmer in the land so that we, so it's not just learning in that little pocket but that learning is shared uh, much more widely that's really exciting the other thing that i feel is vitally important we're doing a lot of work on is what is is measuring the outcomes from farming systems so we get very caught up in setting standards and saying you know this is allowed this is not allowed but actually if we want innovation we need to be looking at how do we measure our ecological score on a farm? How do we measure our water quality, our soils, our biodiversity, our social impacts, our animal welfare impacts uh, in a way that's objective using the same methodologies across a lot of land? And so we've set up something called Soil Association Exchange over the last couple of years, which is doing just that, uh, taking the ecological score measurements of a farm and then advising them as to how they can improve. And that's all farmers, whether organic or not, how can they take the next steps uh, that are going to be profitable for them because we have to make sure that they're going to stay in the money, um, but are going to really improve their environment and their animal welfare and their social impacts too. So those two things I think are really exciting. Um, and uh, they are, there is a whole gang of farmers out there now. Uh, we work a lot with um, at my own farm, with Wild Farmed, Andy Cato's gang, who are doing some extraordinary stuff on regenerative farming, and they are just learning so much and sharing so much knowledge. So there's this upswell of farmers really wanting to change the way they do things, really learning a lot, sharing really generously, and that gives me real hope for the future. Great. Oh, um, I'd like to ask each of you, you know, what role is technology playing in in this sort of change in system and that could be you know communication it could be you know the basic use of hard, te is hard technology whatsapp tiktok even yeah. um you know, you know maybe in in measuring data analysis could, could you just talk about how technology is affecting your life uh yeah so two two ways or two examples one is uh through transparency so the for example, in, in this project I was involved with last year in Mexico, we developed an app which communicated transparency from seed to shelf and the impact of the cacao. So the amount the farmers were paid, the uh, increase in biodiversity and carbon sequestration. And there's lots of companies that are now using transparency. There's one called Provenance. Um, and they're using transparency to, they're using technology to communicate impact and transparency. So that's one way that I think is really exciting. And it's uh, reconnecting people dig digitally to farmers and, um, and to farming. And the other way is platforms like Ubi. So there's these platforms popping up. There was one called FarmDrop, but now there's one called Ubi. And it's a platform which allows farmers to sell locally. So there's hubs all over the country. And it's supporting farmers with software, which then allows them to develop the logistics and infrastructure needed to sell to their local communities. So it's just making lo um, buying local food much more convenient, which is what we have to compete with in this current system. So it's kind of like the Ocado for buying from your local farmers. And yeah, it's a great, great way of uh, reconnecting people to their local food system. And Tom, do you have a... Technology. I am such a technophobe, so <laughs> it's um um I'm I'm a you know get out of there and do the do the yeah. job. But um the the main use of technology for me is about communicating with my customers. You know, it's it's um it's about letting them know what we're doing. Um, it's about uh, sending them newsletters and 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 information about the farm. Uh, it's it's kind of it's 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 letting them know what we're doing and making sure that they're part of that because. Um, of course, you know, you, you don't always have very many minutes when you're on a market stall with them. So that's the main use. I, I'm, I mean, I'm not somebody who uses technology very much at all. Um, as my friends and family will, let, will know, I've never had my phone with me or on. Or um, So, um, yeah, I, but I think that there is a real use for it. And I think that those ideas sound fantastic that Jess is mentioning. Um, I think it really depends on the sort of person you are. Um, I'm very much a kind of present being with people in a in a sort of physical sense. Um, I think I think technology has a place, but I think that um, you know you have to have a certain sort of certain kind of personality for that. And I'm, I am such a visceral person. <laughs> Everything I experience, I you know I experience a lot of it. So having that kind of relationship with with the land, with people, in direct with my animals is where my kind of heart lies. I think. And Helen, I've just got to, I've got to ask you, you know, 
when we think of technology in the future of farming, particularly if you know you sit on TV, uh, it would be uh, you know a landless system, maybe some agroponic hydroponic system. Is it, does that actually have uh, a realistic role to play in food production, or is it just you know a bit of a you know diversion? I think that there will be some landless farming systems that will work. Um, and I, sh I don't think we should completely, you know, reject them out of hand. I think that uh, some of the, you know, we've been using greenhouses for a very long time. They have a role to play. Um, it doesn't feel like when you stack them high, you get a lot of benefits. So I think I gather aero farms have just gone down in the last um, uh, few days. Who were aero farms? Uh, they were a big um, vertical farming uh, initiative in the States. Um, and a uh, lot, of, lot of money went into all of that. And there's a lot of money going into things like cultured meats and um, probably more likely to be successful, in my view, is some of the precision fermentation stuff. And actually, if we could replace uh, the appalling industrial animal farming that's going on around the place, the chickens and pigs and sometimes dairy too, that live in absolutely appalling conditions with a meat-like substance for our chicken nuggets, I'd embrace that tomorrow. Um, you know, it would have to have multiple benefits, wouldn't it? It would have multiple benefits. It would have benefits from getting rid of uh, the, 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 the welfare abuse, the antibiotic abuse, the amount of manure that's produced in some of these industrial um, food animal systems, which isn't well managed and is uh, leaking into our environment. I mean, it, 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 industrial animal farming on the scale that it's being done in many places around the world needs to stop. Um, and so uh, food technologies that might allow us to get off that treadmill, if people won't go away from eating meat-like substances, um, I'm not saying that they're, you know, it's great food or whatever it might be, and I do think animals have a real role to play in doing this, sort of regenerating the land, but industrial animal farming has to stop. Um, so, so I do think there's some interest in that, I'd, I'd, and, um, but you know, it's, again, it's not a magic bullet. It doesn't mean we can uh, get rid of farming on the land. You're... Your, your tuber crops, your cereals, uh, most of these things are still going to be grown in soil uh, for, a lo for a long time to come. But I think there are quite a lot of other technologies that are really interesting too and are really opening up um, the chance for regenerative farming at scale to be um, a, 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 a much more viable option. Uh, one of the things I've got very excited about is instead of having to, you know, we having to have to choose between glyphosate and the plough, which actually has been a little bit of the debate uh, for the last few years. If you're an organic farmer, you have to plough every now and again to prepare your seed bed. If you're a non-organic uh, mintil farmer, you use glyphosate, and everybody's been debating which is worse. Um, well, I think the glyphosate is worse, uh, but uh, the idea of being able to maintain your meadow, your clover pasture, and to be able to stitch your cereals or your horticultural crops into it without ploughing has always felt like the holy grail for me of farming. And I tried it when I came back to the farm 37 years ago and couldn't get it to work because there was no innovative farmers at the time. There was nobody to support that kind of research. And we didn't have the engineering solutions. We didn't have the drills or the satellite mapping, the ability to drill these things very precisely so that you can mow them very precisely. Um, and uh, you know, so a lot of things are being unlocked by engineering and by some of the satellite um, uh, mapping. And it also allows us to pick up environmental data much more easily instead of having to go around and do everything with a, with a, with a trowel. So there's some really interesting stuff that I think will, if we, if, we, if we scrutinize it in the right way, we put it through the right tests, I think there is technology that will really help us. And I'm actually really interested in some of the robotic stuff that's coming through as well, because one of the reasons all those hedges got ripped out was because to make way for these ever bigger tractors, ever heavier, doing more compaction, we can get scale that right down and so that you can have a really complex environment like Tom was describing on his farm with orchards and animals and plants and all these things. But you've got little things that can wiggle between them and do your picking or your weeding because it's the economics of actually picking this fruit and doing all that kind of stuff that makes it impossible. If we could make finally technology fit the system rather than the system having to fit the technology, then we'd really be moving uh, in the right direction. That's what we've got to be calling for. Is this going to actually enable better, fairer, more balanced, more harmonious food systems? Or is it going to, as most of it's done in the past, take us in the wrong direction? So there's some really exciting stuff going on in technology. Um, and uh, we just need to kind of 
you know, look at it with open arms, eyes and 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 try and work out how do you how is it going to support that transition to agroecology that I think we're all on this platform calling to uh, for? Or is it going to drive us further in the wrong direction? Right. OK, thank you. That leaves us with a lot to think about. Um, we've got some time for questions. So um, do we have any questions from the audience? Uh, it's always a bit scary to be the first person, but it's you. Uh, uh, thank you for a very interesting talk. Um, there's been a lot of fair talk over the last two days about not paying enough for food. But in the lowest income households in the UK, people are living below the poverty line and struggling to get food from lowest um, price or own brand supermarkets. Often farm shops and organic food is a comparative premium cost. So how do you make sustainably farmed food accessible to this sizable chunk of the population? Who would like to answer that? I don't want to answer that. Go on, then you go, go, and then I'll go. Um, I think it's a really good and fair point. Um, and I think that you can't do that in isolation. I think that's the main thing to say, is that you can't say, right, everyone has to spend more on organic food. I think it's a, it's a whole, the, the way in which we actually see our society, it's about the way in which we look after people at the, uh, you know, who are the most disadvantaged in society. It's about how we educate those people around food and around uh, looking after the, the, the poorest in society or the most disadvantaged in society. So I don't think it's a question of, 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 of me sitting here saying, you know, we don't pay enough for our food because I want more money for my organic chicken, although that would be quite nice because I tell you it's quite tough out there. Um, but it's, it's a, it's, 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 I don't see myself as a farmer in isolation. I think there has to be... I do think government has a real role to play um, in the relationship between people and food, the land, and farming. You know, we the only things we actually need to survive are food and shelter. And those are the two things that we seem to have a real problem with at the moment. You know, not enough housing and food being inaccessible, you know, to people. And I think that, that comes from top down. I don't think it's, yes, we can support each other. Yes, we can have food banks. Yes, we can, you know, we, th there can be a groundswell of people trying to make that right for other people. But actually, at the end of the day, I think we need to have a... The, the whole system needs to be looked at about how we, uh, how we... how we The relationship between food and, 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 and people. That helps. Yeah, it, it, I th it is about a complete system change. Um, it is, uh, you know, food is, is seen entirely as a profit driver by big multinational companies, not just the big supermarkets, but actually all of those people who are processing this food and selling us stuff that's sick. Now, if we got rid of that siloed thinking, and this does require government and international cooperation, actually, if you got rid of that siloed thinking where you think actually your NHS bill, you know, you mentioned it earlier on, Jess, uh, the SFT work on the true cost of food. Uh, you know, food actually, um, if we got the investment we could make in food to get that right, would save us a huge amount of money in the NHS and in other places. So it's about governments taking a really big view, seeing food as a social service, really. The, Lady Eve Belfer, the founder of the Soil Association, uh, said that, you know, uh, the, our, our farming should be at the front line of the NHS. It should be about a natural, national health service. And uh, if we, we, we need to completely reform it, because it puts people today in an absolutely impossible situation uh, when uh, the chips are down, if they are uh, in, on low incomes. And uh, so you you have got to have governments taking action, understanding cause and effect, uh, being really prepared to act. Uh, Henry, Henry Dimbleby's um, national food strategy went a long way towards being really clear about the outcomes, the, the, the actions that government needed to take. They haven't taken very many of them. It's about us all pushing for that change uh, so that uh, the great kind of the food that Tom and we've all been talking about today is available to everybody at an affordable price. Um, and if we change the way we do our food, if we changed our farming systems on a mass basis, 
we would get those economies of scale. Uh, we would bring down the price of what we do very, very quickly to one of the challenges, a little organic niche uh, market is that you're having to take it further to get it processed or you're having to, uh, you know, you're, you're a little bit on the shelf over here. Uh, your distribution systems are inefficient. Um, I, again, Henry Dimbley showed that if you have a plant based products, uh, going down an agroecological, effectively an organic route, route would put virtually nothing on the price if we did it on a whole scale basis. Different for meat, um, but then I think that's where the less but better arguments come in around meat. Great. I think that was quite a comprehensive argument. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> answer. Um, a few questions. Uh, gentleman with the glasses on the far right. Yeah, hi, thanks. Um, really interesting discussion. I think the theme that dives, drives it all together, and it shouldn't be a surprise, is soil health. And I don't think that's really understood at all levels. It's not just about farming, it's also about development and residential and how we can reduce food, food miles within our cities, within our settlements, and growing food, etc. Um, but also from a government point of view, there's an insufficient understanding of soil health. And without that soil health, we won't have sustainable farming. Uh, is that a statement? Did you have a question? <laughs> it's probably a statement, but it's it's really how we how we raise the soil health profile. So so, so where where does that? How, how do we actually improve soil health I, so that it's valued by not just the farmer, well, the government uh, at all levels? I think I think there is finally a recognition in governments that, and actually in the farming community too, that soils have been um, completely neglected. They haven't been monitoring them since 2007, there's, so there's no data, and uh, it's it's been a real mess. But I think that is changing. So in the new post-CAP, post-CAP agricultural policy schemes, they're putting soil health as one of the foundation stones of the new payment system. So I think that there is finally a bit of a, um, a glimmer there. But you, you mentioned some of the urban issues, which I think we haven't talked about much today. And, uh, and how uh, we need to be designing our food systems so that they are closer to the to fresh food is closer to people who are eating it. And I've al we've always said, too, that grade one and two land, there's so much land being covered over with housing now. Um, how do we make sure we're safeguarding uh, high grade land uh, for agriculture? And when we are building new housing, how we design that in a way that allows people to spend some of their time with their hands in the soil. Because actually, as a society, if we, deserved, if we did that design better of our urban communities, um, uh, we could reap so many benefits for people. So I think that this, doesn't, this isn't just a countryside issue. I think you're right to raise the fact that it's an urban issue, too. And it needs planners uh, to think much more creatively about how do we develop, well, when we've got to develop, how do we do that in a way that gives people access to land and access to the soil? Touch on that point as yes. well, is that um, soil health is also human health. Our microbiome starts to change when we're in a new environment within 30 minutes. And so the what we're eating, what we're putting into our bodies, but also the environments that we're in are affecting our bodies and affecting our health. So we're starting scientifically to see that interconnectedness. But we, as a whole system, start. We, ne we need to start to remember our interconnectedness as a whole. We've been looking in our health system for so long at just when we're ill, looking at one part of the body and not looking at the body as a whole. And the same in farming. We look at one problem, we look at one weed or one pest, and we treat that problem. And we need to start to remember the interconnectedness and that soil health is human health. And that, that humans are part of nature and actually within the, inside all of us. We have well, It's like a two kilogram mass of microbiome, is that right? Yeah. And, and, and actually it goes through all of life. It's, it's everything, isn't it? It's not just, it, it's, it's the way we, we, we function as, as a species on the planet, that we're part of something and that, um, yeah, we're, everything is interconnected. I completely, and, I, and that, you know, that food and health is so important. And that we have a role to play, sorry, just quickly, but we have a role to play here. We, we existed in harmony with all beings and with nature for millennia, and we farmed in harmony with nature for thousands of years, 12,000 years that we've been farming. It's only in the last 150 years that we've come out of balance. So we need to just remember, I think, that we have a role to play as stewards of this planet, because I think we very often move into the mindset of, you know, we've we've really destroyed nature, we don't have a role here, and we get into this, um, you know, terrible habit in conservation of just ring-fencing nature. 
and thinking we don't have a role to play, we just have to leave nature to do her thing. But actually, as farmers in indigenous communities across the world, we've been farming in a way which has actually helped nature to thrive. So in Australia, Aboriginal communities were doing controlled burning, and that actually is uh, an effect of that would, would help nature to grow and thrive. So I just think it's really important to remember that we do have a role to play. Um, we don't just need to leave nature and step back. Yeah. Um, we've got time for one more question. Uh, gentleman with the hat. Hi, um, Mark. Um, just to pick up on the gentleman here's um, statement, um, question for Helen, and please correct me if I'm wrong, but the Soil Association is um, synonymous with organic certification. Correct? Well, we have a certification business. So the Soil Association is a charity that has uh, a group of other activities, one of which is a certification business. Yeah. So, so, I mean, for me, it's best known in terms of stringent certification of full organic status. Yeah, yeah. So uh, to follow up the gentleman's statement here, it do, does the Soil Association have a role in advising farmers that don't feel they can become or don't want to become fully organic? Does it have a role in advising them on better soil quality is is it time to have a recognition or for farmers that actively want to improve their soil health even though they're not fully organic yeah absolutely so a lot of the work we do now is with non-organic farmers who aren't going to be organic um, but they want to improve the way they're farming whether that's through soil or producing antibiotic use or whatever it is so all our programs like innovative farmers all our advisory work works with farmers wherever they're coming from and the uh, outcomes monitoring thing that I was talking about earlier on, uh, the ecological score, that's with all farmers. So we'll always be really, you know, I think organic is great um, and we need to, but we need to help that cross fertilization between organic and mainstream farmers because time is too short for us to be just trying to be perfect. Uh, we need to be helping everybody move in the right direction as quickly as possible. And we've got the knowledge to help with that. All right, I, I'm sure there are more desperate, questions. They're desperate, oh, desperate over here. Okay, okay. Uh, last question from uh, the gentleman in the front row there. Hello, uh, um, Steve Harris. I'm one of the tenants here at Stare Ahead and I'm organic. But what I'd like to do is to find out from the panel, what's the difference between regenerative farming and rewilding? So I think the National <laughs> Trust have got their, their, uh, sort of, they've got their knickers in a bit of a twist because they, they, <laughs> they don't know which way to plug us forward, if you know what I mean. Good luck, Can somebody I'm please give me the it. definition between regenerative farming, Go organic ahead, farming and rewilding? So I, I would see regenerative as an umbrella term, which there are lots of practices which come under the umbrella term, which could be organic, agroforestry, biodynamic. And it's just practices which are helping to regenerate the soil and ecosystem. So rewilding would, in how I define regeneration, be one branch of uh, regenerative agriculture. I, I might see it. Is, am I, is it working? I don't know. Um, I might see it slightly differently. Um, I think um, that rewilding is something for me. It's like something slightly different. It does have a regenerative effect on the soil. Absolutely, but it's, it's it's possibly not actually farming. Um, so I would say that um, uh, rewilding is has it has has a value. Um, you know, if anyone's been to NEP or anywhere like that, it's an extraordinary place and um, the biodiversity is unbelievable and exciting to see. But I think you can uh, you can do quite a lot of that without actually rewilding. Um, and regen farming for me is about having um, looking after soil health. Yes, but it's also about having pockets on your farm that have. A little bit more biodiversity. It's having it's, it's allowing uh, field margins, to, you know, bigger field margins around a, 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 um, an arable crop. It's um, not cutting, you know, the brambles back from your hedges. It's it's it. I think it's quite simple actually to allow a regeneration. I mean, regenerative farming comes from the word regeneration. You're literally regenerating something, and and. You know, just seeing this meadow here, this is a sort of fantastic example of, of, of allowing something to seed, to um, to, to regenerate itself, that, that, those wildflowers. So I don't think, um, I do th see them as, 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 as different, although they're both very valuable for, um, for, 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 the, for the planet. Does that help? <laughs> I think rewilding isn't, isn't normally producing much food. 
uh, it's uh, it's allowing natural regeneration, nature to take its course, and there might be some food or some grazing as a byproduct of that, but it's not primarily about food production. Regenerative farming is about food production, but farming it, it, with nature in mind so that it, uh, you're, you're hitting that balance. And I think actually there is a real need for uh, a mix of the two. There is a need for a bit of rewilding or natural regeneration because some species that we've lost, so many of, are not farmland adapted. Where organic farming or regenerative farming works really well is for those species that have adapted over the millennia to, to good farming, to, to, to sort of that kind of farming system. But some species need pretty pristine habitats to thrive, and we've lost a lot of those in the UK. So I think where you've got less productive land, less la land that's less good for food because it's not so rich or fertile, um, being able to do more regenerate, more, more um, natural regeneration or rewilding there helps us get that balance right. Um, and uh, and I think it's a bit of both. You can do a bit of both on the, on the same farm as Tom's mm -hmm. talking about, or you can have, you know, bigger tracts of land that are going to be left largely for nature um, while you're doing your regenerative farming in a way that feeds people and provides um, good space for those farmland adapted species. But haven't we done that already with countryside stewardship? Uh, no, I don't think so. I mean, I don't think I don't think we've done natural regeneration or rewilding hasn't been part of stewardship. Um, and a lot of our nat national parks where some of that kind of, you know, letting nature take its course a bit more uh, could be a really good solution. We'll create a much more, uh, much more above ground habitat than has been allowed because of some of the overgrazing. Um, I think that that, uh, that that hasn't been part of the system up until now. So at the moment, there's a lot of private money and that feels really controversial going in to support tracts of land going into rewilding. And that feels, I think, really disturbing for farmers who are feeling quite threatened by that. Um, so it's a it's a it's a difficult one to get right. Um, but I think there is a place if you look at it objectively for both. Um, it's just about making sure that communities uh, are buy into whatever's going to happen into their in their place, and you can see the benefits, and we can see how people are going to have a role in that future rather than feeling like they're being thrown off the land, which I think is sometimes the case at the moment. But isn't the carbon credits the main thing behind it all because the money's behind the carbon credits? Yes, so there's quite... Do you want me to answer this or do you want to stop? Um, I, tell you what, I think there were going to be more questions from the audience uh, because we have got the next talk coming up. I'm going to draw it to a close. Uh, if it's OK, you're going to be around. I think this is probably part of a longer conversation. But thank you for your, your enthusiasm. Um, we're going to be around for a few minutes. So if you've got any other kind of questions, is it okay that they people come and come and find us? Yeah. Great. Okay. Well, thank you all uh, for for coming and listening. Thank you to our fantastic panelists, uh, Helen, Tom, and Jess. Uh, thank you also to our sponsors, Country and Townhouse. Thank you to the National Trust and Stourhead House for hosting us uh, in this beautiful, almost perfect situation. Um, if you've enjoyed this talk, please do go to our website, which is planted-community.co.uk, where we've got lots more talks, uh, interviews. We've got loads of kind of partners. Uh, so there's lots more for you to discover and investigate on our website. And in the meantime, please do go and investigate the rest of Planted Country. There are some amazing suppliers, furniture manufacturers, all of the people here have incredible stories and experiences to share with you. So please do go and talk to them. Um, and in the meantime, I just wanted to thank you all for coming and listening and submitting your questions and taking part. My name's Oliver Heath, and this has been Taking the Heat Out of Farming. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.